Good morning, everyone. Happy Lord's Day. So we are back in the office this week, but that's not a problem. Uh, we're hoping that everyone does well, that everyone's okay this week, and Lord willing, we'll be meeting together in person again next Lord's Day. So for today, we're going to continue on in the Gospel of Mark. And so I invite you to join us in reading. Uh, we have a pretty short reading uh, this week. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. It's a short reading, uh, but one that contains a lot in it. So, turn with us to Mark chapter 1, verse 14, and we will begin there. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and followed him. So, in our text this morning, our Lord himself begins to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. So just like we saw Mark and John and the prophets proclaiming the good news of the kingdom in last week's text, uh, now we see our Lord himself proclaiming that good news. And so today we're continuing to learn, uh, continuing to see what the kingdom of God is about. Let's start with what our Lord himself says about the kingdom. His proclamation is this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The very first thing that we learn about the kingdom from our Lord's lips is that it is a matter of God's planning. The time is fulfilled, he says, and the kingdom of God is at hand. I think today it can be easy to slip into a kind of thinking uh, that says that the church is just kind of an arbitrary thing, right? Like, why do people go to church? Why are you, why are why is the Christian religion organized around churches? Uh, well, it's just some arbitrary thing. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of people in the world that, uh, that think that organized religion is just completely man-made, right? And we're not just talking about atheists. We're talking about people who ostensibly believe in God, and yet they have soured on organized religion because, well, for whatever reason. Some people who've had uh, bad experiences in the church, and so they have, uh, or again, any any other number of things can happen. Uh, so the people sour on the idea of the church being anything at all in God's plan. And what Jesus tells us from the very outset is that what is going on in the Bible uh, and we'll see how this plays out over the course of uh, Mark's gospel. We see how it plays out over the course of the book of Acts as well. Is that uh, God's plan, the kingdom of God, is, I mean, first off, it includes the church. In fact, that's, uh, we commonly equate these two terms, the kingdom of God and the church. And Jesus tells us, that this is a matter of planning, right? The time is fulfilled. What he is accomplishing is something that uh, that has been built up to over the course of time. So it's not some uh, some arbitrary, incidental thing. This is the way God intended for things to happen, and they are only happening now in the days of Jesus. Because the, the conditions are right, uh, as it were. God's plan is coming to fruition, right? Things are progressing according to schedule. And 
what God intended beforehand. In fact, we learn elsewhere that uh, he intended this before time. Uh, what God intended there uh, is finally coming to pass, uh, which is why I think Mark opens the book uh, at the beginning of the chapter with words from the prophets right, to show that, again, all of this is a matter of planning and fulfillment. The next thing that we learn about the kingdom is that it requires radical change. And we're going to see just exactly what kind of radical change in just a second. But he says, repent and believe in the gospel. Now, we get an idea in our minds of what the word repent means. Uh, I think we most of the time use the word repent just to mean quit sinning. And that's part of the meaning of that word, biblically. And I think that's certainly part of what Jesus has in mind here, whenever he says, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent, just at its most basic, and this is the way it's used in the Bible as well, it just means turn. Right? Turn and believe in the gospel. We turn from something toward something else. And, again, at this, at this stage, we have kind of a loose picture of what's going on. Uh, but the very next part of the reading is going to give us a more solid understanding of what that turning looks like. Uh, at this point, hearing the words, repent and believe in the gospel, uh, we could get the idea that we are to turn away from sin and to turn ourselves towards God's kingdom. Right? And I think that's a pretty fair understanding of what our Lord means whenever he says these words. Turn away from sin and turn towards the kingdom of God. That means fulfilling the will of God, aligning ourselves with God. Um, but we learn a lot more about that in the very next verses. In fact, that's, that's why I've included them with today's reading. We don't just get this proclamation of the gospel. We also get to see Jesus calling his disciples. But first, Mark gives us this notice about John the Baptist. In Mark's gospel, we've, we've not seen John hardly at all uh, up to this point. But already we learn that John has been handed over. Right, the, the translations in the English Standard Version and in the King James Version explain what that means. He is arrested. He is imprisoned. Uh, but the words there tell us literally he is handed over. His partnership in the kingdom has resulted in persecution. What has happened to John in today's reading foreshadows what's going to happen to our Lord. He will also be handed over. And in fact, Mark is going to use exactly the same words later on in his gospel. He is, our Lord is going to be handed over due to his proclamation of God's kingdom. Now, we're going to find through the New Testament that this is likewise the fate of many who participate in the kingdom. And this is, in fact, one of the things that we are turning towards, or as we say that uh, the message of repentance is turning away from something and towards something else. This is one of the things that we are turning towards. This is one of the things that Jesus has in mind as he is proclaiming the kingdom of God. That the folks who align themselves with God are sometimes handed over and persecuted. The apostles tell us not to be surprised when these kinds of things happen, even to us. We learn that laying hold of the good news, living as a citizen of the kingdom of God, comes with a cost, and that cost is proclaimed early and often in the New Testament. It's never a secret. It's never put in the fine print anywhere. It's proclaimed pretty loudly that hey, if you if you follow after our Lord in these things, 
certain segments of the world are going to hate you, and that hatred is going to come across in different ways, and sometimes that hatred even leads to violence. And we're just, we're just told plainly that suffering for the name of Christ is one of the rights of citizenship in the kingdom. Now, that's one of the things that we are turning towards is in some ways a, a life of, of antagonism with the world, a life of enmity with the world, which also gives us a sense of what we are turning away from, because immediately after proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, our Lord calls his first disciples. And we learn that being part of the kingdom of God requires being a disciple of Jesus. Right, again, this is another one of the things that we are turning towards. We are not just turning towards uh, a set of principles. We're not just turning towards an organization. We are turning towards our Lord, Jesus. And we must do as Peter, Andrew, James, and John did. Lay aside our worldly concerns to follow after our Lord. And there, again, we see that full meaning of repent there, that they are turning away from something and turning towards something. And see what a radical departure the first disciples made. Peter and Andrew, having cast their nets into the sea, left them. Right? This is their livelihood that we're talking about. This is probably a really expensive piece of equipment. They've probably invested a lot of their time and money into these nets. And yet, as far as we know, they have just simply left them drifting and walked away from them. James and John do largely the same thing. They're in the middle of mending their nets whenever Jesus calls them. They leave their nets and they leave their father sitting behind in the boat. Right, just in the middle of work. Uh, and they leave, again, not just their livelihood, but also their family behind to go follow Jesus. Right, and so we learn in today's text that repenting is not just a matter of turning away from sin. It is also a matter of turning away from the concerns of this world. And that can be that can be difficult for us, right? Because sin, oh, that's that's easy, that's obvious. Of course, we should turn away from sin, right? Sin is the evil stuff that we do, and of course, we want to turn away from that. But what we see the first disciples turn away from is nothing evil. They're turning away from their jobs. They're turning away from their possessions. They're turning away from their families so that they can go follow Jesus, the one that they are turning towards, turning to. What we learn today is that there must be nothing in this world that separates us from the kingdom of God. No expense, no concern about this life, not even our very flesh and blood, as we learn from the example of John the Baptist. And so we praise God that he has given us all of these good things in life, that he's given us our livelihoods, he's given us our families, he's given us our freedom, our security, peace and prosperity, but may we never let any of these things stand between us and the Lord. And sometimes what it means to turn and follow the Lord means engaging in a radical departure from the things of this world. So the call this morning is, uh, Jesus has already given us the call this morning. We don't need to come up with anything else. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Gospel means good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God has sent his Son to live among men, to live as a perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. And so whenever Jesus tells us to believe in the gospel, he's inviting us to lay hold of that gift. 
And we likewise invite you to lay hold of that gift. That Jesus has given himself as a sacrifice for all of our sins. And so we call on you to believe in the gospel. To repent, turn away from sin, turn away from the things of this world that are standing between you and God. Confess Jesus as Lord. Be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. And spend your life following after him. We invite you to get, wherever you're watching from, get in touch with the Church of Christ near you. If you're in the St. Petersburg, Florida area, now we invite you to get in touch with us, the 14th Avenue Church of Christ. And any Church of Christ that you go to is happy to help you with these things, to study with you more fully what it means, what the gospel means, what it means to turn away from sin, what it means to turn towards God, what it means to obey the gospel. All right, we've given it very briefly in outline. Um, but any church that you go to can give you a fuller picture and help you become a follower of Jesus. So we stand ready to do that at any time. Well, we want to thank you for joining us this morning. Again, being back in the office, not ideal, uh, but temporary, Lord willing. And we look forward to seeing everyone together again next Lord's Day in person. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.